Inner source is about making the existing process transparent and collaborative. So if you already have technical writers, you'll need technical writers. If you have developers, you'll need developers. The point is how can we enable the people that are coming from different silos to work together? And for this, we need to define a process and we need to use certain tools. Uh, having an inner source portal sitting on the site where people need to know that they want to go and look for an inner source portal, that's just as useless as having an API portal sitting there as a standalone thing that people have to know that they go look for APIs to be able to find it. Welcome to the API in the Docs podcast. My name is Laura Wash, and we're recording in the middle of Madrid, actually which is an amazing opportunity because we met someone who is well known in the inner source community. I have here as my guest today, Danielle Isquirido and Christophe Fantoma, who isn't a host, but a guest this time. So mind your guest. <laughs> and we're here together to talk about the things documentarians can take away as lessons from inner sourcing practices. How do these things play together? And we may or may not get to the point of talking about different types of developer portals that we've seen going around. Let's start with some quick introductions. Uh, first with Daniel. Uh, hi, welcome. Thank you. How did you get into inner sourcing? Oh, that's a good point. This all started, this journey started because we started in open source. Then we started to meet people that they were trying to do open source within the walls of the organization, which is what we can call in a really short way, inner source. And all started like in 2016. When we met the person, Dennis Cooper, that started all of the journey, the term was coined by Tim O'Reilly from the O'Reilly, you all know the technical books back in 2001. That's basically my journey. Nowadays, we have a, an inner source common foundation. It's a, it's a welcoming environment for everyone. And I'm right now a part of the board of directors and vice president of the foundation as well. That's my short story on inner source. And when you say we, who do you mean specifically? Oh, we. Um, so we are a community of practitioners. We, uh, at the Inner Source Common, we are people that have interest in sharing thoughts, lessons learned, creating a body of knowledge, and, and share our, our thoughts on Inner Source to basically the rest of the world. Ideally, we don't have all the time, you know, to, uh, to do the same thing or try the same thing once and again. So this is why we are here, to share uh, our concepts, our ideas, to, to share this uh, body of knowledge, our lessons learned, and move forward all together. Mm -hmm. When you're not uh, a board member of the Inner Source Commons, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're very busy with uh, setting up custom metrics and analysis of open source um, communities, right? So that, that goes back a bit more into the history. I'm currently holding the position of CEO at Viterja, and we are providing insights, analytics, and development information to uh, well, open source foundations, inner source projects, OSPOS stands for open source program offices. So it's all about uh, collaborative environments mm -hmm. to produce code either within the walls of organization that could be inner source or out there in the open source world all across the industry. Mm -hmm. So we'll get back to that also because API Docs is very busy with metrics and the reality of metrics and how they can trip you up okay. big time. And before that, um, our second guest, Christoph Phantom, may or may not need an introduction. Christoph, why are you interested in the topic of inner sourcing and in where do you know Daniel from? I got excited about inner sourcing. I don't remember how I got to know about the first meetup I attended, but it was in Stuttgart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I got excited because uh, it looked like they needed developer portals in that community, uh, but it was like slightly different developer portals. Uh, there were there were definitely not API developer portals. Uh, there were more developer portals to facilitate like reuse and and collaboration between people, um, because I, I think that's one of the patterns in in the community. And mm -hmm. we'll, we'll explain all of this stuff later. Yeah. And what we, we probably also need to explain what inner sourcing is because, mm -hmm. well, maybe maybe a little bit deeper. And I've I've been to a couple of events. Uh, the pandemic threw uh, mm -hmm. also a wrench into that. I was looking forward to Madrid. Yeah, that was back in yeah. 2020. Yes, because yes. in Madrid in 2020, just just at the beginning of the uh, COVID pandemic, was planned the inner source uh, 
yeah. international conference, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. What is the specific name? Oh, Inner Source Common Summit. Summit. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, and I, I was in Baltimore. Um, I, I don't remember. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't remember if I was planning to come to Madrid. Like, probably yes. Yeah. yeah. This is a good city. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so so that that that's that's the history that I have with Inner Source, and and it's um, it's just just generally interesting community. They do they have really interesting ways of thinking about how to spread knowledge in communities, and also that I think is relevant to the API docs community. Do you know if people busy with technical documentation, either the orchestration of it or the writing of it, are are typically involved in the Inner Source community? So the question is around people that are doing inner source or people that are on the inner source commons community. <laughs> so let's make the difference. If we go for the second one, inner source commons community, there are several roles that come at the beginning of the discussions. Uh, perhaps the role were higher level. People that you know, maybe even chief level from some corporation saying, okay, I'm, I'm learning from you. What, what can we do here? What, what does it mean for my business? Then over the years, we are now starting, you know, it's kind, kind of becoming more common. So then we are starting to have other roles. There is the role that might be the most typical, which is the inner source uh, officer, program officer kind of, which is the person in charge of making sense, you know, or making the most of inner source all across the departments in the company. And then we have other roles that are now joining. Marketing, uh, people in charge of communications, uh, technical writers, mm-hmm. developers. So there are different roles that are part of the of the inner source. Mm-hmm. Now, if we go to the first part of the of the question, which is if I want to do, uh, if if I want to run inner source internally in my company, who do I need? Right. Um, so inner source is a lot about cultural change. So that means that we need people that are feel comfortable talking to others, facilitating discussion, and so on. And that's kind of this inner source officer role. But then if we think about the rest of the people that are in the team, uh, inner source, and we'll go for the description later, is a lot about making explicit knowledge. Let's make that this definition now. What is inner source? <laughs> <laughs> okay, do you want to go, Christoph? No, oh, I, I can give it a try. So, so I think you were already explaining that inner source is kind of like doing open source inside of your corporate firewall. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's basically the use of uh, practices that have evolved in the open source community mm-hmm. inside of your organization in a way that is compatible with how organizations function. Mm-hmm. And then um, connected to that, the spread of very practical, applicable knowledge, uh, how to deal with the problems that then appear when you're trying to do that. Uh, so things that I hadn't heard anywhere else about before was uh, like transfer pricing of software assets. Like, mm-hmm. so if you're, if you're working together with an international community of developers that work for one large company, um, how do you, uh, how do you declare where that software was written? Because you're, you're now working from maybe 10 countries doing contributions. And then, you know, where, where do you declare, um, that this asset is now owned? Is it in your uh, American? Uh, um, company, or is it in your German company, or and, and so on, and this has tax implications, stuff like that, which is super super niche, um, but has a really big impact on how do how can you collaborate? Because what what it's all about is about taking uh, that collaborative way of working as uh, a community and using it to basically bust silos in your organization, mm-hmm. so that you can you can uh, instead of having 20 teams that are all doing uh, slight variations of the same thing that you can have mm-hmm. uh, um, like basically a community that collaborates on doing that together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think that's that's what it means for me. I don't know, did, did I do justice to that? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's basically the key point. So the key point here is that we need to be sure that uh, companies, so the main issue that companies are trying to deal with is about breaking down silos because they are geographically distributed. And given the hierarchy of the corporations, they are working in a silo way of thinking. So that means that you are producing typically once and again, as you said, similar pieces of information. Doesn't matter if this is only software, might be documentation, might be marketing actions, might be, might be many things on, on this. So yeah, inner source is a lot on, on this topic. 
So the, the, the interesting thing I've seen or that I learned in the inner source community was, was this concept of patterns mm -hmm. uh, uh, and donuts, I think that's what it was. Well, uh, patterns, yeah. the definition of pattern is uh, patterns are proven solution to existing problems. That's a pattern. Then in the case of the inner source commons, as each time you move forward with breaking silos, talking to people and so on, you start facing certain issues. Uh, the way we are documenting all of this to make sense of all of the, to structure the information is somehow are patterns. So a pattern is a problem statement. It's basically a context, forces uh, against and in favor of certain mm -hmm. movement. And then you have a proposed solution and a resulting context, right? So what we are doing is we are building this body of knowledge by, by structuring information as patterns. Yeah. When a pattern doesn't have a solution, then we call them donuts because yeah. we, you know, you have the hole in, in right in the middle. And I think what, what's really interesting is this idea of uh, how do you abstract um, a solution, not in a, you know, buy my product way, but in a, a set of practices that a team is using potentially with some software tools to facilitate it, mm -hmm. uh, to address common problems uh, that are always slightly different because every company is different, but that, uh, that, that can be uh, where you can learn from other teams about how to do things. So it's not like you're just saying, you know, oh, everybody needs to be agile or, you know, agile is the next big thing that everybody's doing. Everyone needs to do agile. Let's do agile or let's do DevOps or whatever. But that it's, it's basically, it's, it's contextualizing um, solutions that are being shared and collaborated on in a community uh, around the, the problem space of, of software collaboration. And I think that's super fascinating. And we've been talking about similar stuff to do st similar things in, in the API Docs community around social practices and, and how to try to abstract, um, you know, what do you need to do to have a successful API team uh, and to, to support a team with the right documentation to make it successful and things like that. And, uh, and part of this has been inspired by what's happening in the inner sourcing community. Uh, and what we've learned from also from maturity mapping and stuff like that. But yeah, so that that's a, um, on a slight tangent, but that that's kind of like the, <laughs> the kind of short definition of inner source. Yes, yeah. this was a short version. <laughs> okay. So um, the patterns. This is uh, the patterns are in words. Um, so let's connect the dots. Mm -hmm. Inner sourcing, documentation, context. So documentation is clearly the key to the success of inner sourcing and the purpose of both a documentarian and inner sourcing is to reuse assets, preferably in a standardized and streamlined manner. And then Christoph lightly touched also on the international part. So there's the legal troubles, uh, the tax authorities coming to say hello, but um, there is the, the remoteness of it Often in documentation, we're busy with um, fully documenting the details, but with clarity and, but then we bring in explicitness here too, because you're no longer next to each other. Um, therefore you said, uh, Danielle, that we need to be very explicit to be able to reuse um, the software made by another team. And we need to be able to, to, to bring it out of context, but at the same time, mention the context that is necessary for the success to use this thing. And I think documentarians and their specific knowledge to be able to filter what is necessary, what isn't, is essential here. I would say inner source is about making the existing process transparent and collaborative. So if you already have technical writers, you'll need technical writers. If you have developers, you'll need developers. The point is how can we enable the people that are coming from different silos to work together? And, and for that process, I mean, for this, we need to define a process and we need to use certain. Yeah. And then going to your point of documentation, we need to make sense of all of this by documenting all of this. We need to give crystal, crystal clear guidelines as in, 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 in open source. If you think about open source, when you go to a project, you have certain things that are really detailed on how to use, how to install the software, how to contribute back how to do certain things. It's exactly that information, what we need internally in projects. Together with style guides, documentation requirements. So it's, it's a lot, it's the existing documentation we are providing. We need that because that's needed for onboarding. 
you know, new developers, etc., etc. But then at the same time, we need to create all of the documentation layer that is around uh, enabling people to collaborate with others. So, and I think this is also, uh, I've seen, I remember there's at least one pattern that is connected to documentation mm -hmm. in the inner sourcing community. Maybe there's more, but uh, one pattern that I've heard the community talk about, and this is the one that piqued my interest, was that the pattern of an inner sourcing developer portal, a developer portal where you are uh, collecting all this documentation about how to collaborate, like what, what the specific processes are that you need to follow. How do you assign trusted committer and stuff like that, that, that is being documented in those places. Why a developer portal or an inner source portal? It's one of the main issues when you start growing the inner source ecosystem, it's basically that there is no an effective way to find things in the, in, in, within the corporation. Because if you are working in your project or your, you know, with your project manager or so, you have certain narrow view of your, of your daily life and somehow the work that you, you have to deliver. Um, in inner source, the thing is, and ideally this is a cultural change. So we have people that if they are going to start something from scratch, they need to think first, is this already in the corporation? And if this, where, where can I, where can I go and look for this, if that exists? So then this is where we go into the discussion of inner source portal. That's one of the places. And if I find a project that that exists, I need to learn if this is, if this is something that might be useful for me. So then it's where I start reading about the project itself. This is where the trouble already starts, right? Like if I find that project, like, no, you won't. It's typical. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, like, it's part of the naming discussion. things is hard. And even if you named it, nobody will know that you named it that yeah. way. So mm -hmm. what's what? Yeah. So um, it's basically the findability and discoverability yeah. problem might be partially solved by a, an inner source portal. So the inner sourcing community sort of predicted or already knew about the need for this. And now it suddenly became a really hot topic. We don't really know why, but it suddenly became really hot. And normally people identify this with either they find backstage or something else, but they realize that we need an internal framework for reusing our software assets. So the, the thing that I've seen like years ago when I first started talking, well, first started going to the inner sourcing uh, community, uh, where I've done talks about developer portals and what you need for an inner source development. So inner sourcing is a practice that you layer on top of your developer practice. It's a way to transform your developer practices in your organization uh, so that you do things better. When you say practice, uh, because there is the English word practice, but you mean something very specific when you say practice. Um, well, I mean, it's quite general in this, yeah? at okay. this point. <laughs> I'm not talking about social practices <laughs> not right now, but, but um, uh, it's, it's basically what you're trying to do is to transform your culture and your practices so that people will be more collaborative. It's about becoming more collaborative as an organization. So I believe, well, this is my personal belief is that uh, having an inner source portal sitting on the site where people need to know that they want to go and look for an inner source portal, that's just as useless as having an API portal sitting there as a standalone thing that people have to know that they go look for APIs to be able to find it. As an, I think this comes back to this thing that I, I believe that is um, that we're doing wrong in the industry is that we have these technological solution silos just as there's these organizational silos, there's also these technological solution silos where there's the, there's the inner source project and the inner source project has its own portal. And then there's the API program and the API program has their own portal. And then there's the DevOps team and they have their own portal. And like, basically you have just a bunch of portals that are all about like certain ways of working, but people in their day-to-day -day job, they don't go like, oh yeah, I want to do an inner source thing. No, they go like, I need to work. I don't need to do my job. Where do I find information to do my job? Mm -hmm. And if they have to go and look for that information in a bunch of different documentation portals, it's a mess. So, and I think that, uh, that and this is why I'm, I'm quite uh, passionate about this because I believe that we need to, um, we need, we, we can't look at these things in isolation. We have to bring it together into, um, like an, an internal portal, an internal developer portal that is focused on um, whatever the organization needs, whatever practices that you're doing, 
to bring all this information together so that these are not information islands. I think this probably resonates a lot with the, the technical writer community because they, they often end up, I think, doing documentation portals that live somewhere in isolation that can't be found, that, that are not discoverable. Mm -hmm. are the same problem. Let's go easy on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, I don't know if you're observing the irony of if this is really the case, mm -hmm. that these three types of portals, even if there's maybe multiple of them, they live separately, whereas the, the core mission and passion behind this is the streamlined sharing of information and assets, mm -hmm. and they are sitting there separately. Yes. It's super ironic. Um, but if... If we agree that this is the underlying mission, this is why they are created, then what is working against it? Why are they siloed? And why is it so hard to bring this together? Oh, why not? I because nobody thought of it. Or no, people think of it. I think it's business, business culture. But then we can start discussing about business anthropology, probably. That's another discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think so, how large corporations are structured? they are uh, a, a set of small kingdoms. So basically what you are saying is I need, if I have a developer portal for DevOps and I have a developer portal or inner soft portal, then you have two set of people that they have their own budget, their own way of working, their own hierarchy that they need to collaborate and move things forward and, and start working together. From your experiences, where does the momentum of breaking nice silos and working together usually start? So if someone listening says, yeah, where do you go? Whom do you start? Who do you fire up? Who can move this? I think it's business person. It's, it's looking at it, not from a, we're going to use this methodology and now we have a tool for this methodology, but looking at it from what is the need for, of the organization and the people that is working in the organization and how can we best serve that need? So instead of having a, um, yeah, we have our APIs here in, in an API catalog sitting on the site and you have to somehow sniff that you have an API and that you have to go and look for it, that, that it's more like, okay, as a developer or, well, and I'm talking about developers mostly now because like the API community typically targets developers, but how do we enable developers to be more collaborative and, and that it's not like a bunch of different programs that they need to go look for. And I think probably means that you need a developer portal team that is mer that is bringing all these interests together and that is trying to address it as, as much as possible in one place, I imagine. So it's the recognized explicit need to collaborate that starts this? Um, yes, and, and, and to think... Why maybe, wasn't it there to, before? To be, it is there. It's there. It's always it's there. there. I think it's more... I think it's the same thing as the initial impetus for uh, inner sourcing, which is um, why are, how do we have all these silos? Why are we doing all these things in isolation? It's the, the there's too many programming language. I'm going to make an extra language. Or I'm going to make a language to rule them all. And now there's N plus one programming language, a similar, similar thing. So we're, we have too many silos. Uh, we have too many portals. Um, so I'm going to make an extra portal. <laughs> to, uh, so there's a, there's a bit of that probably going on. I think it's looking at it from a more holistic perspective. How can we build developer success by bringing these interests together? So you need to escalate this as high up above the silos probably. as the one who can enforce the holistic perspective. I would say there are two ways, or there are two ways that the inner source commons that I've seen this works. One of them might be faster. Uh, which is top-down approach, basically having a recover. The other one is starting from the grassroots, basically starting at the developer level. In that case, things are slower, but then you have more people, you know, engaging from the beginning. Because developers, so the, the point here is that developers and technical writers and other roles, they want to focus on solving the problems that they are supposed to do, not on discussing politics. That sometimes Certainly happen. not. Exactly. But they do that and they have to do a lot of bureaucracy in between. That's the problem. How, how can we remove all of that um, and allow people to talk to people that are finally executing, right? Either developers or producing documentation or other assets. Mm -hmm. So InnerSource is kind of trying to do that. That's one of the goals initially. It's about removing all the political discussions, you know, hierarchies, uh, going to the top to, to force a decision that is important for my team, but perhaps not for others, and having the teams working together in a way that that collaboration is basically 
key for for all of these projects. Can you can you explain the cheese interface because that I think that that helps stick. Or... Yeah, that sticks the you can never never unhear this. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's hear the cheese interface. Oh, so the first time I, I heard this was coming from Silona, I think so, or Danis Cooper as well. They were they were both in PayPal team. Um, so the, the, it happens that if we have two people, two teams that are willing to collaborate or so, right? Um, let's say I'm team A and then I'm trying to, you know, to collaborate into team B, which is Christoph. Um, and then I try to send something, uh, maybe a piece of documentation, a piece of source code, because my boss told me to do so. So we try to do that. We write things there and then we send this. And then it happens that, uh, Christoph's teams, they say, well, uh, we don't see that this is the right code. They have missed certain information. They don't read the documentation. They don't know what they are doing, basically, right? So basically, they they take the code or documentation and leave this there outside. Uh, so then my boss will ask me, okay, what happened here? I said, well, we send we send the pull request, we send the change request, we send the, what you asked me for. Okay, I I try to see what's happening. So now we start the chase interface, which is basically going through the hierarchy up. Uh, and looking for the holes in the cheese to basically go as, as top in the hierarchy as possible. So basically we can move to the other silo basically, and then start going down because my boss will, will ask, uh, you, you know, the person in top of the silo, we, this needs to happen, right? Big so then, exactly. Yeah. So then this jumps to the other silo and then start going down. Yeah. Right. And then we reach uh, Christoph's team. His boss will ask him, Hey, what's going on here? They, they told me that they produce something and you will say, this code doesn't work. They don't have a clue about what we need in reality. They don't read the requirements, et cetera, et cetera. And then what happened at the end is that they will kind of produce their own thing, basically ignoring our code. And suddenly they have the functionality that we were looking for. But what happens here is that we didn't learn how to collaborate with each other. Inner source is about enabling this. And what we needed to use was the cheese interface in the hierarchy to make this happen. Because we don't know how to collaborate, because this didn't happen, we didn't sit down and say, okay, we are doing this. If this happens again, we are doing this again in this way. Um, we'll try to force again things by using the cheese interface. So this is the cheese interface, basically, <laughs> the hierarchy. So the big cheese is stuck to each other and, and through hierarchy force people to do stuff instead of people talking to each other and collaborating. Because APIs have spread so much and their mission is similar, mm -hmm. um, they're made that the, the soil must just might be ready for an inner source cultural change to take over because it's similar. It's just on a more meta level, on a more practices level, uh, not pure data. Do you think the time is right? So, so I think the interesting thing, and we had a, a short discussion about this with Jay Bloom. We talked a bit about inner source thing. So like, that sounds really, really interesting. I think it's a really good idea. Um, but instead of collaborating on code, code repositories, codes that is going to be executed independently again in the silos, what he thought was that it would be much more interesting if people would be collaborating in an inner source way on uh, assets that are in production, like, and that have APIs. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the projects like the APIs that you have in your organization, that those would be collaborated on in an inner sourcing fashion so that different people from across the organization could do pull requests for features they want to add or things they want to change in the APIs. But there's only one runtime, like there's only one, one place where that API is, is uh, running, but there's an open repository that people can do contributions to and then collaborate on and, and get the stuff that they need to, to be able to uh, do what they need with their APIs. And that reduces a bunch of um, runtime needs because instead of spinning up the code in a zillion different places across the organization, you have you, you can use this for data, um, for like data access to, to run your data program um, in your organization uh, because you, you can basically create APIs on top of whatever data lake that you have and then have different people contributing to it so that it fulfills multiple functions in your organization. That, that I thought was super, super interesting uh, um, aspect of this. Mm -hmm. So a hypothetical enterprise with big silos, um, an enthusiastic team of technical writers who are already hoping to become central editorial teams because ChatGPT is taking over the writing anyway, 
Um, you have a fantastic DevOps team and you have a DevRel team who want to prove their worth uh, again. Okay. What can they do? What do they need to be there so that they can show quick success of this? What needs to be there already? What is the, the fastest way to show the success of this? How do they not break the momentum? What do they need to make sure that it's already there? What ingredients do they need to be able to set up even an example that this works? What, what I have seen, because these teams have their own purposes, but what I have seen, actually I had a call yesterday uh, with a customer who was talking about um, like their internal developer portal. And uh, we had worked with them in the past on uh, an internal development portal, an API portal. And they were talking about it that like, they're going around in their teams to investigate what is it that their developers need from this portal. And what was really interesting is that this had shifted from uh, a developer portal being a part of an API gateway, so being part of a solution that's provided by the vendor, to the developer portal now gaining new new purposes. So instead of just being part of a, a technical solution, the developer portal is becoming a central place for people to collaborate. And so I think one way of addressing this, but I don't know, Danny, if mm -hmm. you have other, uh, you have better uh, examples from the inner sourcing community. Uh, and, and I know that people in the inner source community have very clear ideas about how to get started. But what I what I sense that maybe for the tech for the technical writer for the API docs community is relevant is asking this question, how can this developer portal that we have built as an artifact to host our documentation, how can we make it much more useful for the organization? So that it's not just part of some technical island, some technical silo, but it becomes a central, um, a central space, a central open public space for different teams to collaborate and do different things together. And then when you start looking at what are the capabilities that you need to be able to do that, then you, you start having a developer portal as its own thing uh, that, that can become like a central place to collaborate. Uh, and then you might have metrics in there to, to show like how well are people working together or is there already reuse happening um, and, and stuff like that. And, and um, yeah, and also documentation about how to do APIs, how to do inner sourcing, how to do DevOps. Uh, if you have a new people onboarding in your organization, how do you get started? How do you use how do we use Kubernetes? Maybe some golden paths and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I've seen some examples in I think the Dev Framework words where full transparency is essential. Like for okay. example, Digital Identity Corporation in their public portal is also what they themselves use. So the same thing they're looking at from the inside and the outside. There is one source of truth. It was very interesting. And they could do that because they were a digital yeah. native company. Of course, it's not that easy with other companies. So if this can happen, given your experience with metrics, what would you say is the evolution of the things you should start measuring to prove success? Oh, that's a good question. So we are mentioning the word collaboration once and again. So that's one of the very first steps to, to start with about measuring success, let's say. There are different shared assets across the organization. Might be documentation, might be uh, guidelines, might be source code, even even uh, uh, marketing material. So there are many things that, that all the organization or all across the organization can start collaborating and producing things. If you are using certain places to, you know, for instance, uh, if you go for usual way of sharing source code, we can think of Git repositories, which is a tool we can work together to do certain things. Uh, in the documentation ecosystem, I assume there are similar tools, so you can start collaborate and review in others work and so on. So basically all of these uh, can, be, can be gathered, can be retrieved, and basically it's about checking if people coming from different silos are working together, are starting to produce something together on, a, on, a, on the same asset perhaps, or if there is a review process of the documentation or the source code, if this is happening as well. Is producing something together really the first step? Wouldn't it be that at least they are using the central asset? That's reusability of the asset. Specifically in the case of inner source, we really point to collaboration because that's the real pain point. Because the, the, the problem typically, and 
what, what I've seen that happens, and we go back to, to your question, is that you have one piece of code that is uh, together with documentation and all around, right? That is part of the core business. And then you as a large corporation and you say, okay, this should be, would be fantastic for my other countries, right? Let's take this, let's move it to the other country. What happens there is that if you have this in 10 countries, suddenly, because you are reusing the software, you start 10 development lines. That's not collaboration. By collaboration, I mean contributing back. Once having one place that everyone is reusing. And I think that if you're doing Doxus code in your organization, um, you probably can see the similar um, telltales of reuse in, in your Doxus code. So if, if people are not coming to you to ask like, hey, this doesn't make any sense, or there's nobody filing um, issues about a piece of, a piece of documentation, or, or you, you don't see people like commenting on things or, or so on, um, pro it, there's a good chance that people are not actually using it. You know, probably you have some, some information about usage, but uh, like the whole reason for doing Docs code is that people would be collaborating on documentation. And uh, then similar metrics that you would be able to use in inner sourcing to mm -hmm. see like, okay, uh, are there people from different silos collaborating on the code? You could also check like, are people collaborating on the condition? I, I mentioned mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So going to your question, how can we measure uh, success? Then reuse, just reusing, pulling the code or documentation or so, that's one way. The real one, and that's probably the business case for inner source is that it happens that you are producing once and again similar pieces of code and you want basically to remove that way of working and producing one core part of the code. And then of course you may have localizations for different countries or for different reasons. The language would be one of them. You want this in Japanese, in English, in Spanish, and so on and so forth. We use the word success, the very first thing about having success is having metrics that tell you how you are, who you are, basically. It's like having a mirror and say, okay, I have two eyes, this is me, I look like this. I'm behaving from a development, from a documentation perspective in this way. So now that you know that, what are the next steps? How would you like to improve yourself as an organization? Do you want to be more collaborative? Good. So then what you are saying is I need to define certain policies to make this happen, whatever they are. And then probably it's when you bring a specific metrics for this. So what are the metrics to measure success in collaboration? So what I would say, it's about having people from different silos that might be a squad in a giant team or might be a full country in, in this. Having people from different countries, for instance, to work, to collaborate in the same piece of code or documentation. That's one of the very, very first steps. And ideally, from the macro management perspective, another useful metric is to learn what before was the development teams producing the same piece of code, similar piece of code once and again. You see that all of them are working together Basically, and ideally, in the best case scenario, you are basically faster to market. You have more eyes looking at what's happening. The thing is basically higher quality. It doesn't matter if you are producing code or documentation. You have more people looking at this, right? And then you have more people that are aware all at the same time of what, what is being produced. So basically, you are kind of spreading the knowledge across the organization of what's happening there. That's success. And then if we have contribution, we can measure those. So it's not only about reusing, it's about contributing back. For closure, if you agree, would you give me each a shortly described hypothetical scenario and guess for me, what maturity time would you give to evaluate the metrics? I mean, you're constantly monitoring, of course, but when would be the time that you would say, okay, this program is mature enough to even decide whether to continue or to terminate or to... How much runway should I ask? for when I want to set up this program? I think as much time as you possibly can get. And I'm just starting to build momentum. I think it's a lot about how do you get collaboration happening and bringing more and more people onto your platform. Uh, so that rather than having a bunch of silos that are, are happening, that you can, you can have it in a central place. But I think these are, these are things that are about cultural change and that's notoriously hard, but incredibly important. Um, because like a, a culture of collaboration can mean the difference between basically a, a bunch of a bunch of silos that are fighting with each other versus one an organization that has a shared purpose and that is that is moving in the same direction. 
how much time to ask for. I, I would say ask for as much time as well. <laughs> So <laughs> the times are right. This is the last moment to do it. You have everything ready, but it's also the worst time because right now to ask for a budget for something that is notoriously hard and we can't even measure it easily and we need as much time as possible, that's not going to go down easy. No, but, so? it's, but it's basically, I think it's the wrong question. I think that the question should be, hey boss, um, don't you also think that it's kind of crazy that we're wasting 30% of our developer capacity on doing the same thing in 10 different ways? Um, why, why, like I heard this and I've told this story a lot of times, but um, we, we heard this on a podcast that unfortunately we couldn't publish in the end. It was, um, somebody who works at the government who said that, uh, they like, because I was asking about API success and he said that in their government, uh, when they started looking, they found out that there were, I don't know how many different departments of the government that were using the same database for applications. And what they had done was they basically replicated the database. Now, which is a terrible idea because basically uh, you have to like somehow synchronize the databases, which is already going to be really hard. Um, also, they were running this in cloud, which cost a fortune. Like there was millions that they were spending on this. And uh, basically what they did was they, they turned it into a shared database with an API that is now consumed by all these applications and it saved them millions. That is a story in these times when we're talking about um, like cost savings and uncertainty and so on and so on. Uh, this huge efficiency is that can. Um, and I think there's a lot of um, a lot of waste that has been created by blindly adopting the the next technology methodology. Um, fashion, like uh, scaled agile and so on and so on. There's, there's a bunch of these things that, that basically are just like, well, oh, follow my one methodology and it's going to change everything. And I think um, looking at this from a, okay, but let's get real. What do we need in our context? And what are, um, what are patterns that we can apply to our context that really apply to our context? from these different uh, methodology spaces that are going to make us more efficient. And then there, this is a no brainer. It can save an enormous amount of money, uh, both in infrastructure and in development costs. So when, when you've just uh, like a lot of the companies in the tech space that have fired 10, 15% of their staff, like you, you really need to go and look like, are we, well, first of all, maybe some of that staff was kind of holding the silos together. So maybe you're really in trouble. Uh, but then also like, how, how are you going to do things more effectively now that, that you have to run with less people? So I, I think that, um, I don't think it's a problem to sell to your management. I think this, this is, a, um, everybody wants reuse always, uh, if, you know, if you talk about cost savings, definitely in this climate, um, in terms of time, normally government, uh, like normally companies will set their own timelines and they'll say like, you know, you've got three years or four years to prove that you, you are, you're moving the needle or so, sometimes less. But I, I think that being careful with what you promise, because this is cultural change and it can take time. I don't think I answered your question, but I hope. Maybe I'll answer it. What I'm actually thinking about right now is that before uh, we use AI to even faster produce parallel, a whole lot of inefficiencies and digging assets even deeper yeah. to get out of even bigger silos of content that you'll never find your way out of. Maybe first find a central place and then start. I see the role of experienced technical writers and editors and technical communicators huge in this because they have the affinity for this. How do you connect the dots? How do you bridge the gaps between teams? Because that, that is what a technical writer does. Yes. That's yeah. also the past podcast we talked yes. about this with Fabrizio, that one of the roles of, of, of technical communication is bridges, yes. building bridges. And Daniel, given your experience with inner sourcing projects and mm -hmm. measuring uh, community activities, how much runway should the team ask for and what kind of promises should they dare to make? Okay. Say they're building, a, they have the decision to build an inner sourcing portal, an internal developer portal. What should they be prepared for? Yeah. What promises should they make? 
we are nowadays in certain economical situation all around the world. So basically that means that all companies are kind of taking care of the budget. So that's one of the promises at least they can try to do it somehow is like, we are definitely taking care of the budget because we are with this central piece here, we'll be sure that we are, what we try is to reuse, contribute back. So we are collaborating, we are creating something together. So we are not producing once and again, the same thing, which is basically not, it's inefficient, right? From a, from a macro level perspective. That's one of those in terms of, uh, well, going, going to the previous uh, question that you asked us to be, to be sore and <laughs> to have a short, short answer is how much time. So based on, on my experience with customers to start flying somehow to start, you know, having something that then you can effectively use internally in the company, we are heading at least for a couple of years. For a couple of years, what, what we do specifically is we, we... A couple of years is two? Yeah, two years. Okay. Yeah. At but, least two, let's say. Yeah, yeah, of course. Like it's, it's to start with. It's like, okay, uh, so having tools is easy. Call any of your providers and they will say, yeah, that could be done in you know, a month or six months, but you have the tool that you need, right? Processes, then we start to dig into something a bit more difficult, depending on the ecosystem, if this is a regulated environment or not, maybe you need to talk to regulators to change certain things. And then we have cultural approach, which is probably the, the hardest thing to deal with here. So this is, is because of the cultural approach, the, because the, the, the time is so long. And what we are kind of saying is that in two years, what you can have is like, uh, somehow define the processes aligned with regulations, probably having the right tools to do things. And then we are probably starting with a cultural thing and somehow, you know, starting to build a common vocabulary, mm -hmm. uh, starting to build a common sense of ownership of the things that we are building together, having creating cross relations across the different countries or departments. After two years, you start having something that you can rely on, I would say. And then at the inner source commons, we know of companies that they've been doing this for years. I mean, there is a public use case, for instance, by uh, Boss specifically, that they, they've been doing inner source for, I think, almost a decade now. I mean, I mentioned the, the 2016-15 when the, the, yeah. all of this started, but they were doing, not calling that inner source, but they were doing this, this trying to do this, this way of collaboration in their, their innovation departments. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about those number of years. Okay. Where to go to learn more about internal portals and inner sourcing? Internal portals? Uh, I need to finally write that blog post. Um, so it, it'll come on our newsletter, I would say. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Subscribe to our newsletter. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll get it in your mail when it's ready. Um, <laughs> inner sourcing? Yeah, for inner source, you have innersourcecommons.org, and there you have some, some things you can consume. There are some books that are starting with inner source, adopting inner source, which are use cases in the industry, what we call the learning path with videos and articles that you can follow and keep track of basically the very first steps of inner source. So for instance, how is my product owner now behaving in this inner source ecosystem, right? What is the concept of trusted committed that we mentioned before? And then we have the patterns community as well, and this is building, you know, this proven solution to, to existing problems. There is a new community now, which is called ISPO Inner Source Program Office that stands for this, which is about if we want this central place where we can take care of all of these things, including our inner source portal, then the ISPO sounds to like the reasonable place for this. So we are now with this, this working group. So I would go there. Well, uh, I would argue that the portal should be an internal left portal, not an inner source portal. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, yes. we can discuss that this is uh, something, yes. a subcomponent of something else. Yeah. 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 Sure. yeah. Or the other way around. Or the other way around, that the inner source program office provides this uh, internal portal, uh, but where other things like APIs are also welcome. And that, that can start forming one place to go. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for the discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Looking forward to your blog post. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the API The Docs podcast. We thank our colleagues at Pronovis Developer Portals for letting us work on this, and the entire API community for all of the mutual support and sharing of experiences that you give each other. Do you have a topic or guest that you would like us to spotlight? Drop a note at podcast at pronovix.com. If you go to the website, 
api.docs.org, you can find the recaps and recordings of past API The Docs conferences, as well as the upcoming program. Until next time, be well. <laughs>